Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of And Action. It's already episode eight. I can't believe it. The weeks are rolling around the clock, and here we are talking about writing part two, how to develop castable characters. I'm here with Mike Messier, my co-host. I'm Tommy Danucci. We're going to take you through the world of crafting characters. Mike, how the hell are you, brother? I'm good, Tommy. Good to be here again with you, buddy. And uh, thanks to uh, our viewer base that have been uh, asking eagerly when we're doing the next show, Stephen E. And everybody's been very kind. So uh, you can always comment during the course of the show and we'll address those statements. And uh, happy to be here, buddy. Yeah, we're going to try something a little different this week. Uh, Normally, we've been holding uh, all the questions till the end and we've been getting to them at the end of the show. We're going to interact a little more this week. We're going to switch it up. So as the questions fly in, we're going to try our best to get to them while still trying to maintain on track because we got a lot to talk about when it comes to developing castable characters. Um, But before we get into all that, Mike, how's your week going? What have you been been getting into this week in the world of Mike, the movie maker, Messier? Tommy, as you know, I run a film festival called Avalonia Festival. We're coming up on our seventh year or seventh uh, live event will be this November. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I decided to spin off into a photography competition, Avalonia Photography Competition. So most of my day today, buddy, was making the final judgments on the winning photographs and then uh, awarding those photographs with their accolades and putting them up on the website, which is avaloniafestival.com. So people want to check out some award-winning photographs it's free to look it's uh a-v-a-l-o-n-i-a festival.com and look for the apc2 which stands for avalonia photography competition 2 beyond that buddy still promoting those books uh fighter play basketball novel distance from avalon i actually have a uh directing uh short films uh primer i call it now available on amazon uh wrestling with sanity comic book and the pro wrestling trivia book are all on Amazon. So that's what I've been working on. It's a lot. That's a lot, buddy. We're keeping busy. Trying. How about yourself? Well, as you know, I've been rolling through the ADR process on Johnny and Clyde, which is the movie I uh, co-wrote with Nick Principe and directed uh, with uh, Verdict Productions. It's going to be coming out sometime at the end of the year. And, of course, it's starring Megan Fox. We're all really excited about that one. And the ADR process, if you don't know, basically, whenever we record a movie, there's always going to be sound hazards and contaminated environments. We're just not going to get great sound. So what we do is we go in and the actors actually have to match up exactly what they did and match their voice and recreate that sound. So it's a very specific kind of a thing. Um, But yeah, uh, Stephen E. just checked in. What's up, Stephen E.? You'll notice the blonde hair is leaving my head. Uh, which is a fact, and it's kind of funny. This is a stressful month, everybody. I'm just going to come out. Maybe I'm going to use the first couple minutes of the show here just to be like some active therapy for me. Sure. Um, <laughs> and listen, it's all it's all stuff. It's all good stuff, and it's all things that I've wanted my entire life, but it's just kind of crazy how it's all coming together. Seemingly in this one month of June, um, you know, this month alone, I have to finish Johnny and Clyde, which is by far the biggest movie I've ever made. Um, I'm finishing a couple of other smaller projects, just directed a music video, which I'll be finishing up. Uh, and the big thing is I've been booking a lot of parts. I just got cast in another film that'll be coming out, um, which I can't say much about just yet, but that'll be start starting up in uh, a week. And I'll actually be on two different overlapping films, uh, cause I'm shooting another film towards the end of the month. So there might be some situations where I have to shoot like an overnight in Connecticut and then drive in the morning, you know, shoot all night, wake up in the morning, drive to Rhode Island and work a full day. And it's one of those things where like, it's kind of funny, you know, you can't complain. Those are the kind of things that you always kind of dream of doing. Um, But I'll say this, it's definitely challenging and I don't sleep a whole lot, but it definitely, it's making me want to sleep a little bit. It's wearing on me, but it's all good. And uh, you know, like I said, it's all positive stuff. It's just a lot. I'm also, this is kind of random, but tomorrow morning at, 10 a.m. I have a Zoom with uh, a couple guys, uh, really great collaborators. Uh, Jacob Cooney, who's a writer, director, oh, yeah. and producer, and David Bateman, who's a composer, terrific musician. 
And I don't know if you remember, but I did that movie Merry X Mass uh, a couple months back. Uh, I, remember, I think it was a March, couple of years April. back. No, no, no. Merry X Mass okay. was just yeah, just in April. Uh, and I play a British okay. rocker. That's why I have the blonde hair. In oh, the that's first right. Place. Okay, yeah, yeah, gotcha. And on the day, uh, Jake, the director, and I kind of just came up with some lyrics to a Christmas song called Santa Sack, uh, which is a little comedic, slightly sophomoric. Uh, but it's very fucking funny, and it's called Double Santa Sack. There's yeah. a lot of du- there's a lot of innuendo in the song. Sure, um, double meanings. Yeah. And tomorrow morning, I'll be hopping on a Zoom to work with the composer David and Jacob, and like you know, we're going to be recording the song eventually. And he wrote some. David wrote some really cool music to go with it. Uh, so it's kind of funny. It's going to be like one of those musical pieces that accompany the film. Um, so that's going on tomorrow morning. Cool. Uh, just a lot of stuff, man. So I, you know, it's good to be busy because you remember what they always say, Mike, you can't sell goods from an empty cart. You got to yeah. fill that wagon up, load up your wagon. And sell well, it, some shit. Sure. They also say, if you want to get something done, ask a busy person. So it just, uh, kind of proves that you're active. You're getting things accomplished. You're uh, in high demand amongst your uh, colleagues and, Everything is is positive, but on the flip side, I do see kind of what you're not saying, which is just sometimes um, it can be overwhelming for anybody. You're trying to wrap your head around a project, but then you've got five other projects to wrap your head around or whatever the body count is, and I can get that too. So it is the yin and the yang. I mean, look, we're, we're happy to be doing what we're doing, but at the same time, it's okay to be human and have a complaint or two when things are overwhelming. So it is. I'm I'm really good at that. And thank you, Stephen. Uh, Stephen says congratulations on Johnny and Clyde. I'm one of those guys who I can get through almost anything, but I need to complain a little bit. Sure. I need to vent it out. Like I'll yeah. bitch and moan about something, but I'm never going to quit. I'm never going to back away from it. But you're going to hear some some pissing and moaning along the way. And you know what? Like you said, that's just like the nature of the beast. And that's right. sometimes how we we process we all process our 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 struggles and challenges a little differently. Um, but overall, it's a blessing, man. I'm I'm so excited to to be where I'm at, and and I've been on the other side of it too, where you know that phone isn't ringing and nothing's going on for a long time. So we definitely prefer this. Um, but today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite things in the world to do, which is writing and developing a story and creating characters that get people to want to be involved. You know, it's all about, you know, we've heard it a million times, but like, you know, attaching actors to your script or getting people excited about your script. Why would they want to do it? And it all goes down to writing really character, really great characters that get people excited right off the page. They start jumping and people want to get involved. And today we're going to break it down. We're going to talk about not only like a technical aspect, you know, what goes into writing and developing these kind of great memorable characters but also we're going to break the wall down a little bit on the business side of things and explain why there's a bit of a structure and a bit of a formula to how you go about writing these characters for a technical aspect in terms of casting so we're going to talk about all that and more mike but i think we should probably just start with you know what it's like to to develop your lead character you know numero uno number one on the call sheet yeah, uh, sounds good to me. I mean, uh, we, we've got a couple of examples uh, from your career we can talk about. Um, uh, let's see, there's there's Vault, which uh, I believe the lead actor was uh, Theo Rossi. That was his name, right? And uh, then you've got Almost Mercy, which were a couple of actors that were not as famous, uh, you know, at that time for that film, but they were very important. Danielle Goulden was the lead female. She was great. And uh, then this... Uh, Johnny and Clyde, I'm not sure how much you can talk about uh, the characters, the actors at this exact moment. Uh, yeah, it's actually, thanks to you, Stephen. It's actually Avalonia with a V. Uh, you take the B out and put a V in, you, you got it. Uh, Avalonia Festival. But you've got um, Megan Fox, who's a big deal. Uh, but, but I think what you're getting at, Tommy, and you can kind of guide the ship on this one, is that on several of your movies, Megan Fox, Don Johnson, Chaz Palminteri, you got a lot out of them in the movie. Uh, you got a lot of scenes with them in your films without actually having to take a whole lot of time of their busy schedules, which effectively saves you some money 
you being the producers of the film save some money and also maybe makes it even possible at all to work with these people because they, they have such busy schedules that it's hard to even get them booked at all. So if you've got a project where you can get them in and out in a week or two days or whatever, uh, I think that's kind of what you're getting at is one of the lessons here. Am I right? It is. And, and you know, like you said, and I want to dive into this in great detail later in the show, but it's beyond just saving money. It's literally to the point where it would be absolutely impossible to make the movie any other way than getting them in, uh, you know, at a curtailed schedule. So, um, you know, you're absolutely right. And we're going to get into all that as we, we go on down the line. But we're not going to get too, too much into, you know, the critical components of each character, because let's face it, like there are so many different genres and different types of films out there, different types of leads, uh, different types of films. Uh, A lot of these rules apply, but they won't always apply, you know, but the idea is, you know, one thing to keep in mind is it's all been done. You know, it's a, it's like, you've heard that before. You want to try to avoid cliches as much as you can when you're looking at who's going to be the lead in your movie. Um, You know, the whole, the traditional, uh, you know, goody two shoes type characters that can never do any wrong and they're always correct and they have no flaws. You know, those types of characters are very dated and and nobody cares. Nobody really wants to have a, a true, you know, pure protagonist. Uh, I think, you know, the, the fine line that you always have to, tread when creating your lead character is you need to find someone who is relatable to everybody that we can you know as viewers as the audience we can see ourselves in them and understand their plights and kind of walk in their shoes a little bit but here's the hard part they need to be so unique that they're worth watching for two hours or whatever it may be you know what is it what is it about that character that yeah, they're like me, but there's there's something extraordinary, or there's something special, or there's something different that they go through that makes that ordinary person uh, react in an extraordinary way. Um, so those are things to kind of think of, and I I know it sounds simple, uh, and there's a lo- always a lot more to it than that. But just rule number one is just always avoid cliches. Never make it so easy where it's just all going to just happen for your main right. character challenge your main character your, your main character should have a lot of tenacity and go through a lot uh so just be thinking about that as you develop that number one obstacles is a word that comes up a lot in these uh, screenwriting books and courses that a main character should have some type of objective something they're looking to accomplish whether it's to win the big race or to get the girl or to get the job promotion or to you know, save the veterans from the MIA camp or whatever the storyline is, they have an objective and then they have a series of obstacles, uh, human or elements uh, that prevent them from accomplishing said goal. And that's kind of your movie, you know? Yeah, and I think it's also important to, you know, find ways to humanize your character, your main character. Well, I mean, really all of your characters should have humanizing qualities, but particularly that lead again it comes down to you know what makes them relatable to you whether it's you know the you know for example uh not to jump around too much but you know i'm, I'm going to show my my heritage a little bit here but we'll mention tony soprano on, sure. on the sopranos like what makes that character so special and so humanizing is the fact that he's got a family like everybody else like every other average you know schlub uh, he might be the boss of, of a crime family, but when he comes home, he's still got to deal with his son's bullshit or his daughter or his wife, you know, whatever is bothering him. Like, you know, the fact that even the, the mob boss has to take the trash out and just go through those normal life obstacles. I think those are the kind of, you know, elements that make that character who's very much like us, but clearly very much not like us because, you know, we're not going to go into the city and, and shoot somebody later that night either. But we know what it's like to, to deal with the kid who gets thrown out of class or whatever it may be. Sure. Um, shutting my phone off. I broke the cardinal rule of, of production here by having yeah. it on. I hear you, buddy. I'll check mine too. Uh, but um, interesting stuff. So 
let me ask you this, Tommy, and you can you can tell me or, or not, but do you want to do like a case study of one or more of your projects that we can kind of use as an example, or, or do you want to just speak in more general terms of all the films? You know, I think we can kind of do a little bit of both, Mike. You know, I think it's important to, obviously, before, look, before we even get into anything that I've done, just kind of, I just wanted to share some of the general principles that I kind of think about when I'm going into like, you know, thinking of who's, who's the lead and, you know, it's not always going to be the hero of your story because right. like I said in the beginning, like this is a, a very broad topic. There's many different types of lead characters out there, but generally avoid cliches, find things that humanize them, find ways that connect them to, the other people in the world that you create that make them special and different and ultimately watchable um, because, you know, that's what's going to make an A-list actor or really just, you know, a notable actor that you want to work with, read it and, and kind of separate your script from the other hundreds of scripts that they're presented with on a monthly basis or whatever it might be. I guess you could say that there's a possibly, and you can, Correct me on this one, but sometimes your protagonist is not the exact same as your central character. Maybe the central character is actually the antagonist or the villain. And could, For sure. could, could it be said that self-storage with Eric Roberts as a central character and antagonist is an example of that? Possibly. I don't know, man. I mean, you know, self-storage was a while ago, and it's been a long time since I've given it a watch. Uh, but... I do know it pretty well, and I think that you could probably argue that Jake and his friends are the the you know central characters. Um, we just are with them the most in the story. Um, but I do agree. I think that you know not all you know your your hero or you know your good guy, for lack of the better word, doesn't always need to be the lead. And that's a great way to kind of segue into segue into the antagonist. You know, like let's talk a little bit about. And again, it doesn't always have to be the hero. You know, we're talking about writing castable characters. So let's talk about, you know, those are a couple of couple of basic traits for your hero. Okay. Avoid cliches. Yeah. Don't make Go it too ahead. easy for them. They should have kryptonite. Even Superman has his vulnerabilities and the ability to get, you know, taken out. Um, so now we're talking about bad guys. I mean, I'm not uh, probably telling you anything you don't already know. But playing bad guys, playing villains, that's ultimately like one of most actors, that's their favorite thing to do. Oh, yeah. Everybody loves playing those characters. Uh, I think there's an element of escapism in it. I think there's an element of, you know, we all want to, you know, everybody would like to kind of be that bad guy, the villain, the, you know, do whatever they want and not have to answer to anybody. You know, we all kind of relate to that. Um, what do you think it is about the villain, Mike? What is it about the villain that makes us all kind of gravitate towards them? I think you're on the right path. I mean, I think we all kind of have the yin and the yang, so to speak, of our personalities. And there's probably a part of everyone that's a little bit repressed from our animal instincts. You know, we all want to kind of go out into the world and attack it and do whatever we want. And, and characters that we see like Darth Vader or... Um, who's so power hungry and, uh, you know, characters that we see that are so Apollo Creed, who's so charismatic in the first two Rockies, although he later on becomes a supporting protagonist. Uh, and I've seen, I kind of noticed a trend with that, Tommy, you know, like a lot of the classic uh, villains like Darth Vader and like Apollo Creed, once you get three or four movies into it, they flip them from the villain to the, one of the heroes because, uh, the audience kind of loves these characters, you know? Yeah, you begin to, uh, you know, be so drawn to them that the writers or the people behind it realize, you know what, we we got to get this person working for us. We got to bring them over. Uh, you know, nah, we don't want to talk too much about wrestling tonight. Uh, in fact, this is all I'm going to say about wrestling for the rest of the night, with the exception of one potential thing about cameos, which we're going to talk about later. But uh you know, famous example of that, Mike, Ric Flair, the nature boy, all right, who's still wrestling, technically still active. He's going to wrestle his last match, match. <laughs> uh, at the end of July. Uh, I believe he's, what, in his late 60s? 
Yeah, he's early 74. 74. God, <laughs> God 74. bless him. Yeah. 74 years old, he's going to get back in the ring. Right. But the reason why I mentioned Ric Flair is there's a guy who was a bad guy for so long that people just were so drawn to him being a bad guy that eventually <clears throat> they had no choice but to turn him into a good guy. They had a, you know, because when, when he comes out, everybody's cheering him on. So it's like, eh, I guess we got ourselves a baby face here. Stephen you know. E has a great uh, example as well, Tommy. If you look at the comments, uh, similar in Cobra Kai. Yeah, I'm overdue to do my Cobra Kai season four response video, Stephen. But Cobra Kai is a great example. They took Johnny, who's uh, famous for attempting to sweep the leg at the end of the first Karate Kid, and uh, basically turning his character inside out and kind of making him at least the first season of Cobra Kai as kind of the central character protagonist and. Uh, they've done so many things with that particular show. With uh, they've even brought back Reese, and they brought back uh, the the Terry uh, character from like Karate Kid Three. So it's I mean, funny. <laughs> it's funny, Mike, <laughs> because so Re now Reese was like, wasn't what, was it Ricky Barnes? Wasn't he like the badass from the second one or the third one? Is he in the Terry, show? Terry Terry with the long Terry hair. Yeah, Terry, yeah, yeah. Black, Terry but do you Silver. remember in the third yeah. one there was like a young fighter that Terry Silva was grooming? And I oh, think yeah. his name was yeah. Rick Barnes or Ricky yeah. Barnes. And he was like a young, young badass that was supposed to beat up Danny LaRusso. Right. See, now, listen, this sounds funny and we're just kind of bullshitting. But to bring it back around, like these are memorable characters, these are castable characters. That yeah. movie was kind of like one of the B movies of the franchise. Yet here we are, 30 something years later. And I'm still asking, like, yeah, what was that guy, Ricky Barnes or Terry, yeah, whatever the Stephen fuck? Stephen E. says it's Mike Barnes. Stephen Mike e. Barnes. Yeah, Stephen yeah. E. is our, our resident pop our culture expert, uh, guy expert here. really. You know, Thanks, Steve. You. We appreciate that, brother. Um, but, yeah, basically, you know, it's one of those things where those kind of characters, uh, they stick out in your head. And it's funny, Mike, you haven't seen Stranger Things. And I haven't seen any of these Cobra Kai shows. They've both kind of got this 80s vibe. <laughs> I feel like we should really like do ourselves the favor, it sounds like. And I should buckle down and watch some Cobra Kai. And you should buckle down and watch Stranger Things. Sure. Uh, and we, we probably have a lot more respect for each other, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, wow. But some more some more classic like villains. Because I just love talking bad guys. Oh, boy. Well, you know, the, the Joker. Sure. The oh, Joker. Yeah. Many incarnations. I mean, yeah, and every incarnation, for the most part, sticks. Uh, and, you know, what do we love about the Joker? Well, he's just so insane. And, we're, you know, he's so drawn. He's so captivated by what he's doing and convicted, I should say, in what he's doing. Uh, and we'll go down the list, like Hans Gruber from Die Hard. Hannibal Lecter. There's one of my personal Silence favorites. Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Silence of the Lambs. What all these characters, you mentioned Darth Vader earlier, what they all have in common is the fact that in their minds, they're 100% just, 100% in the right, and everything that they do is for a reason. Like, in their minds, the, everyone else is the bad guy. Like, what they're doing is right. And I think that, you know, when you're writing, you know, when you can, when you create that villain or that antagonist or whatever it may be, that, you know, you've got to be thinking about almost like if you're them in a sense like well how do like why why are they in this position what happened to them to get them there you know we mentioned Darth Vader well he he lost the woman that he loved he lost his ch his children and his his mentor yeah he got a little hot he got a little heated he got into a fight with his mentor and his mentor literally ripped him limb from fucking limb uh and he's left in a a flesh burning stump uh sizzling in a lava pit he's fucking pissed off okay everybody he ever loved turned on him and only the dark side was there to pull him out of the shit so suddenly we start to to realize why he's doing some of the things that he's doing and when you can create characters like that that have a deep enough backstory where even though they're doing the most fucked up shit right you say to yourself, okay, I I wouldn't personally do that, but I could see how somebody in that situation might be pushed to do so. You know, there's a I've I've quoted this before on the show, Tommy, but you know, my favorite quote 
on the villain subject is from our uh, wrestling buddy Michael P.S. Hayes that says a good uh, he says a bad guy doesn't know that he's bad, you know. So I love that. Yeah, the the bad guy doesn't. Even know Even though that he's I bad. promise to not talk about wrestling for the rest of the night, there's a perfect example of Mike said it. The bad guy's not always bad. Continue on, Mike. I just wanted to. I just wanted to recant the fact that I said I wouldn't talk wrestling anymore. And here I am talking wrestling. It's okay, buddy. Um, we, uh, I, want, I have a T-shirt in my closet somewhere that's black T-shirt with the four different uh, contemporary Jokers on it. The Nicholson Joker, the Heath Ledger Joker. Uh, what's, his, what's his name? Jerry Leto. And, uh, of course, Phoenix uh, – Joaquin Phoenix. So the four different Joker heads are all kind of facing cool. out. And uh, people love that shirt when they see it. And then it's just like a conversation starter because it's like, well, who's your favorite? Who's your second favorite? Who's your third? Who's your least favorite? You know, and but I mean, there is um, Kurgan. I would I, I'm a big Highlander fan, especially the original one. And this actor uh, who's done a lot of great things. Clancy Brown is his name. I actually remembered it. But Clancy does such a great job as this kind of punk rock, six foot seven tall, sword wielding Kurgan character that goes after Christopher Lambay as they're fighting for immortality in the streets of New York City across 500 years or so. Uh, I'm sorry, Mike. What is this again? The Kur the Kurgan from the Highlander film. Okay, copy that. You lost so, me for a second. Yeah, Kurgan played by Clancy Brown who has been on a lot of TV series and so forth since. But uh, the Kurgan is an awesome villain. And so awesome, in fact, that when other Highlander movies came later, you know, various sequels and reboots and the TV series, I don't think any of them were as effective because they never had a villain as good as the Kurgan. So they all kind of right. you know, lived, lived in the shadow and, and even my buddy Mario Van Peebles, who's a great actor, and I worked with him in this movie Hard Luck, but he tried to play a villain very similar to the Kurgan in a Highlander sequel. It really didn't work as well. You know what I mean? So just a little Highlander uh, story there. Not to be confused with a um, one of the d disposable coffee makers that you make with the one shot. I think that's a Kur <laughs> that's, Kur yeah, I know. Kurgan. That's, I, know. Yeah, I know what Kurag? it is. Yeah, yeah. Is it Kurt? Kurt, yeah, no, Kurt. Kurt have you Kurt not Kurt. seen Highlander, Tommy? Mike, you know, for some reason, I missed Highlander, and I, I know, shame on me, um, but I remember it being was it, it is it, was Highlander part of like the USA Network television programming? It with, did have a yeah. Is that the had, Highlander that I'm well, thinking of? Sort but of. There was a movie. Too. Sort of. The movie came out in 1986, of what I'm okay. talking about. And and you are talking Mike, about... Mike, I was two years old, God well, damn it. You're I know, you're that's no excuse. That's no excuse. You're talking about the TV series that came around 92, 93, 94. Right. And the TV, the TV series was a Highlander story, uh, and it, it was good, and it was well-received. But what I'm saying is they also had a series of feature films, like five or six of them. And Never the knew first, this. Yeah, the first guy to play the villain, Clancy Brown, did such a great job with Kurgan that others, you know, uh, Michael Ironside was in the second one as the villain. Uh, Mario Van Peebles. Mario like Van. A... Go ahead. Mario Van Peebles, I think, was in the third or fourth one. And my point is, they tried several times to put different bad guy actors in that spot of the villain. But they could never recapture the same magic. And no, those are great actors. Michael Ironside's right. great. Mario's great. But the the Clancy Brown, that was like his jam. You know, like that was his deal. Like he was the Darth Vader of the Highlander movie. And no villain ever since really ra rise to that occasion. The movie's great, Tommy. It has Queen does the soundtrack for that movie. Uh, Princes of the Universe, a kind of magic. And the opening scene, uh, guess what? has Michael P.S. Hayes in it. That is something else. It all comes back to wrestling. Uh, let's move on here to Stephen E. says that's what, uh, that's when I write or play characters. I play the truth, their truth. That's what it's all about. That's how you get people onto the, you know, swaying from side to side, the villain, 
the hero, the villain, the hero, believing it's all possible and that it's all really something that could happen. Backstory, so important. They had a life before they hit the screen. It's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, it's kind of funny because there's a there's an old acting adage where it's like, you know, it's like and there's a several there are several different ways to say it. But, you know, what just one way is like the beat before the scene. Like, what was this actor doing right before this scene? You know, it's kind of like the moment. It's a nice thing that, yeah, it's like something to have, like, just in your head. It, you don't have to tell anyone. You have to go around like impressing other actors on set with what they were doing, but just always be thinking about like, oh, what were they doing? Were they walking down the street? It was raining outside, so they're a little out of breath. Uh, were they nervous because of something? Whatever it is, think about what energy they're bringing into the scene. Well, it's the same thing with writing. You know, it's like you should be thinking about what kind of energy your characters are coming in with uh, before we see them on the page. Sort of. Um, shout out to Ari. How I saw you, something, Ari? Ari, if this is the same Ari uh, I'm thinking of, I believe he just, there was some announcement that he's been cast in a movie. It, yeah, like, congratulations, Ari. Ari. Else? Tell us, I think tell that, us was, a little that was bit. him, right? No, I think it was Ari. I saw him, um, Ari and I are pals on Instagram, and I saw something on his story about a production. We'd love to hear more about it. Yeah, uh, Again, buddy. you know, congratulations. Part of and action is not just getting on here every week and, and having a... a a movie venting session and trying to you know, just to tell some stories and share experiences, but it's also to build a community, try and get some people together that are like-minded and talking about what we got going on. And who knows, like I'm hoping that one day a couple people on our feed uh, link up and make their own movies together or, you know, start their own projects or maybe co-write a project together. It'd be really cool if some artists got together and started collaborating just from watching and action. That's what we hope could happen. And give us um, roles. Yeah, and then hire me, damn it. I got an action figure addiction I gotta I gotta pay for. Oh, look at Freddie. Real quick. Yeah, we have Freddie here because yesterday we talked about it on last week's show, but um yesterday was Robert England's birthday. Happy birthday. Shout out to Robert England. Uh, yeah, who had another another year of uh terrifying people on the planet. Uh, so we're going to jump over to supporting roles now. We talked a little bit about your, you know, the two leads, and what it's like to to have your, you know, your kind of your leading characters. But let's talk about the supporting roles and what it's like when crafting supporting roles that get actors excited. You never want to skimp on the supporting roles because often these are the most meaningful uh, characters. Because what that means is. We've used this before, run of the show. You've heard me say this. Run of the show basically means that you're going to, you know, we're talking bi the business side of things, the producer side. Run of the show is often going to be from day one to the very end. It means that you have the actor the whole time production's going on, which is very expensive because they're there the whole time. Big money, take a lot of time out of their schedule. Well, a supporting actor, you don't need run of the show usually. You know, sometimes a supporting actor, you can film them in, you know, a couple, two, three days. Uh, so that's where you can put your most meaningful piece of talent. And I'm using air quotes if you're listening to this, if you're driving in a car when I say meaningful, because it sounds mean and it sounds hurtful. And I don't mean to, to sound like a, a, I'm not trying to look down on anyone's career, but I think one of the biggest misconceptions, and I really had to learn this one quite a bit is what actors quote mean something in a movie. And what I mean by mean something is I mean value, believe what it or not. There's yeah, there, there's basically like a formula to all of this in terms of value. Um, like, you know how there's the Kelly blue book, which is designed to price up a car, you know, there's Kelly and you can go online and you can be like, what is a 2005 Ford Mustang go for with this amount of miles and it's never been in an accident, blah, 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 blah. And you can usually get a pretty accurate assessment of what that car is worth. It's called the Kelly Blue Book value. And this is the kind of thing that is, is known in the industry when you're selling cars that like, hey, look, I'm selling it for, you know, a little bit under Blue Book value, you know, like, and people just assume that that's what that car is worth. And it's a nice measuring stick it's a nice financial barometer right yeah. well 
there's really no Kelly Blue Book about, uh, for, for movies. However, there is this formula that all the distributors know about, all the producers that are worth a shit know about, and anybody that really knows what they're doing and is making money doing this is cognizant of. And one of the things that always kind of jammed me up in the beginning is just understanding who has value. You know, there's a lot of actors that you may think are worth a lot, meaning like, oh, if I got so-and-so, and I'm not going to name names because honestly, that's not what this show is about. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not here to do that. That's kind of like some of that stuff's very personal, top secret stuff that has taken me a long time to develop. Uh, and there probably will be some opportunities at some point down the road. If we do live shows, we might set up a paywall at some point uh, where we get into some of those kind of nitty gritty things where you do get to hear names and you do get to hear, uh, you know, where the value is at, if that's something you're interested in. But for now, you can pretty much take a when, when I say you, I mean a, a distributor, a lot of production companies, they could take a film based on the script and based on the cast, based on the budget, and kind of tell you right off the bat, like, okay, this movie's going to be worth X domestic and X foreign. Uh, right. you know, so it's, this, is what, this is what you're going to get here. In the, and by domestic, I mean here in the United States. And by foreign, I mean in the dozens and dozens and dozens of other territories worldwide where the movie's sold. Um, so the reason why I bring that up is and it's changed a little bit over the last few years because of streaming services, because, you know, television now is not quite what it used to be. But I remember when I first got into the business, you know, whatever it was, 15 years ago, I remember being excited hearing that, like, you know, work, there was a filmmaker that I was working with. And I remember seeing names of some actors that were potentially interested in the project that, that we were doing at the time. And a lot of the names were TV names. And there were people like, I was like, oh, my God, that'd be so cool to get so-and-so or this guy or that guy. And at the time, it's like, yeah, you know what, though? Those people have zero value in a film. They might have value in television, but they don't have any value in a film. Um, so I always found that kind of interesting, you know, figuring out, like, who is worth what. And I don't mean to go down a rabbit hole. And that really this is a whole different topic, you know, in terms of, like, piecing together you know the the kind of granular uh aspects of putting together the the package as they call it you know what makes a movie valuable and trying to piece it together and sell it um but ultimately the reason why i bring this up is you could have a really kick-ass part in your movie and the actor might only need to come into town for three or four days and mike had mentioned a few of these uh in the past uh, for me, and you know, this is something that I've been doing really since the beginning beginning of my career. Mike mentioned Eric Roberts. You know, that was a 15 day shoot. Eric was only there for I want to say four or five days. You know, um, so every movie that I've ever done, from Self Storage, my first movie, to Johnny and Clyde, my last movie. Uh, you know, like I said, Eric, we had in for a few days. Johnny and Clyde, Megan Fox, she was there for a week, basically. You know, and it's one of those things where there's a science and a a sort of a, a an approach you can take to where in that, you know, four or five days. You can get so much out of that particular part where it appears as though they're in the entire film the whole way through. And the, the I don't want to say trick, because when you say the word trick, it's like. It seems like you're trying to be deceptive and it's not that you're trying to be deceptive, but technique. the reality is, the te yeah, the technique, that's a great word for it. The technique is you don't want, nobody wants to be watching a movie and, you know, they see a big name actor and it's in one scene in the beginning and they never come back or they watch the whole movie. And then at the very end, there's just one random scene with a big actor and it's like, eh. The audience almost feels slighted by that sure. when they're like investing in a film and they see this big name that, you know, their face is on the poster. When they were scrolling through whatever streaming platform, they saw their face on the poster. It's almost like false advertising. Like, isn't this person in the movie? 
and then you watch the movie and they're in one fucking scene and you're like you feel gypped can i give you an example on that uh sure to to the extreme as vanilla ice would say down here in florida but i went to see a movie at a film festival maybe 10 years ago and the movie uh i guess i'll just say the title uh give them some press uh searching for bobby d and so the movie is about a would-be Italian-American young guy who wants to be an actor. And he's convinced that if he can only get an audience of Robert De Niro to see him do some acting, that uh, Bobby De Niro will take him under his wing and, and nurture his acting career. So the whole two-hour movie or whatever it was is about this guy trying to find Robert De Niro. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, they got to get De Niro for a cameo, at least in this movie. You know, he's got to show up at some point. His, his Bobby D is in sure, the game of the Bobby movie. fucking D, yeah. <laughs> Searching for Bobby D. Well, the, the movie ends and there's no... The movie ends and there was no Robert De Niro. And um, I felt a little gypped. I felt a lot gypped. I mean, I, I mean, the movie, it was okay. It wasn't great. But I feel like that that's an extreme case. That movie didn't even have De Niro in it at all. But you're right. There are other movies... A lot of uh, straight to video fare and stuff like that. I'm going to date myself now. Sure. Uh, I remember one of the biggest ones from when I was a kid. Um, so I was a big Steven Seagal fan as a kid oh, because yeah. I just I loved that. Yeah, I love who didn't love Seagal in the 90s, right? Sure. I mean, that was that was before we learned what a fucking psychopath he is in real life. Yeah. Um, but in you know in the 90s, Seagal was the man. And I remember I want to say it was like 94, 95. I think now I'm gonna say 95. If, if I had a bet on it, there's a movie called Executive Decision, I believe, and Steven Seagal in the movie, like in all the trailers, was positioned as like it's like one of those plane movies where some shit goes down on a plane, and there's another plane that flies above it and drops like these badass assassins, on, not assassins, badass like special forces guys to stop the assassins on the plane. And I remember like watching the trailer and Seagal was like all up in the trailer. And then I remember watching the movie and like he he boards the plane, he gets on, he kicks a little bit of ass and then like dies in like 15 <laughs> minutes. He gets yeah. sucked out of the plane. And I remember being like, what? Like, yeah. like the whole time being like, I might have even like <laughs> tapped my dad and been like, he's coming back, right? <laughs> you know, like I pictured like at the end, like, he, oh, he was actually hiding in the engine room the whole time. And he just, no, he's, motherfucker's dead. <laughs> and I remember, like, later on in my, you know, like, as, obviously I was a little kid when I saw that movie. But then talking to, like, some friends who actually, like, you know, I had developed some, some friendships with some people who actually, like, worked on that movie, you know, in the production side of things. And they were like, yeah, that was, a, that was, like, really, and it's funny if you pinpoint it, that was, like, kind of, like, one of the last, like, truly big budget like you know massive like on 3000 screens nationwide major motion pictures that Seagal was in right. and it was kind of like yeah and they were like yeah that was kind of like when he was just grabbing a quick paycheck and his his star was like it's kind of funny like Hollywood knew that he was done before the rest of the world did almost and right. he kind of just came in and he did this little cam it, I don't want to say cameo, but really it was a fucking dressed up cameo. And he just came in, he, he had like one or two little fight scenes and then got killed. And it was like, wow. So, um, you know, that's obviously a poor example of doing that. What you want to do is, and I've got some methods on how to do this. Uh, so writers listening along that are trying to uh, develop something that'll get, excuse me, that's going to get somebody like uh you know that big name excited about it but also gonna get the production aspect of things to be attracted to it is try to write that main character in such a way where they're in a lot of little scenes a lot of short scenes do you know what i'm saying like try yeah. to and, and there there's a little literally tricks aka techniques as mike would say Whereas, you know, if you write a lot of scenes with your, your, I don't want to call them your, your, your lead because they're not, but we'll say your, your big name that you're trying to squeeze in there in a few days, a couple, two, three days, be smart about where you shoot them. Don't shoot them in a lot of locations. Make it so that they can be shot in one location 
but on multiple days throughout the film. And what I mean by that is it's a lot easier to get that actor to change their wardrobe and suddenly it's a new day, but they're still at their office. They're still, you know, at their factory, at their whatever, fill in the blank. House. So, so yeah, house. So that's like one little trick. Like try to keep that person in the same goddamn location. That way you ain't traveling them all around. Would I suggest that uh, those that particular location would be preferable to be an interior location, Tommy, as opposed to outside? Because then it would have because, the weather is such a factor. Yeah, exactly. You know, like Mike said, like, well, we were planning on shooting this at a golf course. Well, it started fucking pouring, and you only have this guy for two days. Now what do you do? You know, so right. the other nice thing is, like Mike said, if you shoot it in a house, well, now you can put them in different rooms in a house and suddenly they're in a, you know, they're in the same location, but you're getting different looks out of it. So rule number one, try to try to keep that name, so to speak, in, you know, one or two locations. I wouldn't exceed the uh, 15 page mark with them, you know, maybe 20 pages top tops, because then you can really do like, you know. A good production running a feature in about a 15 to 20 day shoot is usually going to be working at around six, seven pages a day. So if you have, you know, 20 pages with this unique kind of lead that you're bringing in just for a few days, well, now we have three really good days where you could be shooting seven page a day clips. Um, Stephen E chimes in with, um, that was a tip a writing coach gave me. Utilize your space well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's why I personally love shooting in, you know, obviously who wouldn't, but like I love shooting in like big houses with on a big property. Sure. Um, with like outbuildings and things like that. Like on Johnny and Clyde, there was this one location we shot at, um, which is called the Cloud Museum, I believe, in uh, Warwick, Rhode Island. And what was so unique about this place was aside from having this big, like, you know, literally like, I want to say pre-Civil War era mansion on the grounds, there were all these outbuildings and horse stables and wooded areas and, you know, little trails, and things like that. So you can have your production truck show up in the morning and you can get so many different looks without ever having to have the wheels up and moving and everybody's kind of in the same place. So Stephen, your writing coach was spat on utilize that space um but anyway back to the whole you know try to go for that like 20 page mark and here's the deal don't be trying to write these like five six page massive scenes try to write two page scenes and think about it you know in one day you could bang out like four really strong two page scenes that really are memorable and you know again less is more they get to the point they have a lot of punch you're in and you're out um that's what i would recommend you know really just keep the scenes short and keep them so that again write it in such a way so that that character and i don't even know what your script is so who knows this is obviously very vague to a degree but you should be able to use this apply this method where couple scenes in the beginning of the movie, couple scenes in the middle of the movie, couple scenes at the end of the movie. Act one, act two, act three. If an audience can be watching a movie and see your your big highfalutin name in each act, beginning, middle, and end, mm. in their mind, they're not going to be thinking about like, hey, they were only there for a couple days, huh? That I feel, you know, that was a weird little cameo. In their mind... They're in the whole fucking movie. I don't know what you mean. They're in the beginning, the middle, and the end. So that's kind of the trick. That's the technique, technique. we should say. Technique. Today, right. we're taking the word trick. We're crossing it out. We're circling technique. and kicking it to Mike. What do you get to say, it's, brother? It's all the what way you have positioned to say? something, right? What, what do you have to say for yourself, brother? Well, your 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 uh, situation there, technique of, of putting the kind of featured star, let's, you know, into the three acts of the movie reminds me, believe it or not, of a boxing technique 
that Sugar Ray Leonard used to beat Marvelous Marvelin Hagler in 86, I believe, which was um, in the final minute of each round, and a boxing round is three minutes, Sugar Ray would try to get three bunches of punches, is what he called it, bunches of punches. He'd try to get three bunches of punches over on Hagler, preferably headshots, in the final minute of each round. So the theory was, even if Hagler dominated minute one and minute two of their 12-round fight and it went the distance, Sugar Ray was, in a sense, you know, stealing or techniquing some that last rounds. Memory, the last memory <laughs> yeah. that the judge would because, have. Right, the last memory. Yeah, the th there's three judges in boxing, so Sugar Ray was giving them the impression by dominating or at least putting up a, a better – present presentation so to speak in the last minute of each round that oh yeah sugar ray won that round and sugar ray won that round and and, and sugar ray who had been retired for a few years and hagler was so dominant and such a favorite to win that fight uh sugar ray ended up winning a, a very uh, close decision i think two two judges gave it to sugar ray and one set a draw if i'm if i'm remembering right but just kind of reminded me of your of your thing there that's a cool point. We love to connect sports to films here. Uh, here on And Action, you're going to find a lot of connecting uh, movies to res pro wrestling and sports. Sure. Um, so if that's your bag, you've come to the right place. And if it's not, we're going to teach you how maybe you can learn a thing or two from sports and pro wrestling. Um, and I think, Mike, to this day, I bet you if you sat down with some old fight fans, they'd probably tell you that Hagler won that fight. Um, yeah. Agler Stephen E, work. tell us what you think. Stephen E chimed in and said that he's he's a bit, appears to be a bit of a marvelous Mar Marvin Hagler fan. Did Hagler win that fight for real? Did Roy Jones? I mean, not Roy Jones. Did Sugar Ray Leonard? Sugar Ray steal that one? Uh, Johnny is back. Johnny, who I think you met in real life, didn't he work on a movie uh, up there in the province? Yeah, we have we have Johnny Yagavone. Is that, are we saying that right? Um, let me see here. Johnny Yagavan? Yagavani? Yagavani? I think you had a real life Johnny moment. In I did. Johnny and I got to hang out together on the set of cool. uh, the Brian Greenberg film Junction. Yeah. And we had a nice chat, man, over there. On, uh, it's funny, you know, only on a movie set will you be like in, you know, we're shooting in downtown Providence uh, on a street that normally, if you weren't making a movie, you probably. Uh, a couple guys wouldn't want to be just like chatting at three thirty in the morning uh, on, and then sure enough, uh, me and Johnny had a nice chat about uh, movies and wrestling, and he's got a connection with David Gear. Oh, we have a pronunciation here. Yagovani. Yagovani. Kind of rhymes. Yago Johnny Yagovani. Johnny good, Yagovani. Good Hollywood name. Yeah, good, good acting name. It is a good, good acting name. So, yeah, we had a good time chatting with Johnny. It's always cool to, you know, it's funny. That's the cool thing about uh, Facebook and social media in general uh, and their connection to films. Like, there have been so many times, and, I, and it takes me a minute, so I apologize to anybody who's been through this with me, but there's a lot of times when you meet somebody in person uh, after being friends with them on Facebook for fucking years, you know what I mean? And you've you've really never actually seen them. And sometimes you'll bump into them at an event and you're like, hey, hey, I'm, and I'm like, oh, you're the guy. And suddenly that that little image that you've seen for years and you know, just an icon with a little picture is like breathing <laughs> and, and talking in front of you. And you're like, huh, people, people really do exist. This isn't all some weird vortex that's created cyber. inside of a cyber laboratory. These right. are real people. Um, so, yeah, uh, cool to see Johnny. Cool to see. Uh, real life folks, Stephen E would be cool to see you someday, buddy. It would be great to, to meet up with you, and maybe one of these days we'll have an and action, a big and action party uh, at the Barbecue. end of the year, <laughs> and uh, yeah, a little and action reunion. Um, so yeah, as we're moving on, we talked a little bit about what to do with your casting because at the end of the day, we don't want this to ever come off as what's called stunt casting. Has anyone ever heard of that term before, stunt casting? Does anyone know what that means? Mike, do you want to explain to the people what stunt casting is all about? Uh, well, Ms. we have uh, new, we have Miss Ash checking in. Hello, Ashley. How are you? 
we're talking a little bit about casting actors, characters, and we're going to teach you about stunt acting right now. Mike, you know, what's stunt before, acting? I, I see this stunt, uh, stunt, stunt casting. casting, stunt casting on the notes. To be honest with you, buddy, uh, I'm thinking of hot shotting, but I, I, I would, I'm going to defer to you on stunt casting because I think that's something you know a lot more than I do. And I don't want to misrepresent what you're talking about. Sure. So. I mean, basically, like what I'm talking about with stunt casting is just, you know, adding stunt casting is basically putting a person in your movie just to get a reaction. OK, but ultimately what it ends up being is a distraction. Um, and sometimes when you plug too big of a star into a small role. Or when you try to have some kind of a, a weird or interesting cameo, uh, like a, a music star or an athlete, a pro athlete, and you just stick them and shoehorn them into this like one particular part, it could be a little weird. So like you want to avoid like writing parts where you're just going to like try to stick somebody in for one scene. Again, it gets back to like, if you're only going to do something once in a movie, it's probably not worth it. Like if you can't lean into it. Um, so you want to avoid doing things like, you know, personally for me, like I'm not the biggest fan of like leaning outside of the world of really just traditional actors, you know, like I'm not a huge fan of, you know, a, a lot of times today you'll see, social media influencers are big now and there's a lot of you know people that may move the needle in terms of like numbers on instagram or numbers on tiktok but they're not like truly talented actors those are kind of things you know like to me that's kind of like stunt acting you know like if you were to just like if some reality tv star uh were to get a part over like just a really good actor just because you want to get a rise out of people and, you know, get a little bit more press put up sand onto the movie because of, you know, some bullshit. To me, that's not what I would personally do. You know, I, get, I think I might have a few examples, Tommy. I remember, but it's going back like 15 or 20 years ago at this point, but I believe Paris Hilton, who was so hot with her, you know, so to speak with her reality show, uh, Paris and Nicole, uh, but they, she was put in a couple of movies where basically it was put Paris Hilton in a bikini by the pool for a couple of scenes. And none of those movies left any type of impression that I even remember the title. Um, but I'm thinking of different things throughout the years, Tommy. And uh, I see your point here. I mean, I, I think there's been some maybe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe, like for instance, OJ Simpson was never really offered a major motion picture after Brentwood in 94. I mean, he had done several movies, the Naked Gun movies and an HBO uh, series about football. And, and he, he was done after the 94 uh, debacle at his home in Brentwood. And uh, then you had... Um, Wait, but, do you mean when he most likely killed a couple people? Is that yeah, what you're talking about? Yeah, okay, right, yeah, right. Just, just trying to be, just to, trying just to, to, just trying to be keep clear. it clean. Yeah, <laughs> but, but basically his days of being... The juice, nobody, even people with bad tastes, didn't shoehorn OJ into their movie because, you know, he, I think he did do a music video, but that was probably self produced. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think OJ athletes are, you know, a unique thing to talk about. You know, there have been a lot of crossover at, you know, athletes in movies. That's probably. I almost don't want to go too deep into this because we probably could do a whole show on athletes, pro athletes in films, um, especially since, you know, every other movie reference finds its way into a sports reference seemingly with us. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think like what it comes down to is I, I actually have a, a fun story about that. Um, and I won't say too many names because I do like the people involved, uh, I, you know, but I was basically presented with on the movie Vault got a call from a friend basically saying like, Hey, um, I think I could get Rob Gronkowski to be in your movie. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. I was like, you know, I'm a huge football fan. I love Gronk. Who doesn't love Gronk? Sure. Um, and I think Gronk is one of those players that's kind of like almost bigger than the sport that he plays in the sense that like Gronk's appeared in WWE Gronk's done 
countless commercials, everything from Dunkin' Donuts to or Dunkin' to uh, you know, uh, really everything under the sun. Um, and I said to myself, oh, it'd be kind of interesting. Yeah, there's some social media parallels there. It's a new. It was a New England crime story. He was a big New England patriot. Um, and then of course you know, got the price, so to speak, and what it would have cost to get Gronk to be in the film for the day. Uh, and it just, you know, again, I'm not saying anything negative about Gronk, but just at the time for me, like I, I didn't even really take it to my producers and, and try to push it because I just remember thinking like, you know what? The last thing I want while people are watching my 1970s throwback attempt, you know, recreating the mid seventies when they're watching the film, I don't want some random prisoner that maybe says one or two lines to be Gronk. Cause then it's like, suddenly like you're watching the movie the and you're like, show. Hey, is that Gronk? <laughs> yeah. Gronk show. Like, is he going to spike the football? Like suddenly like you're out of it. Like suddenly like the, incredible effort and hard work that that myself and the entire team has put forward to preserve this tiny little microcosm of 1975 and make us believe that you're really there well you're out of it now because now you're like it's Gronk That's yeah where's, where's like Tom yeah example of stunt casting you know like just putting a person in a part just because you can just because they're famous if I could offer Maybe this is not stunt casting, Tommy, so you can chime in on this. But I would say that someone who I'm not a huge fan of, but he's very popular, and he did some great work in the Hangover movies, Mike Tyson, with the tigers and with the tattoo, and uh, you know <clears throat> the Ed Helms character getting the Tyson tattoo on his face. I don't know if that was Hangover 1 or – I think it was Hangover 2. That was actually. the first one. That was the first one? Okay. So, yeah, that I was mean, the first one. But I mean, like, for instance, I'm not a huge Tyson fan, but a lot of people are. And it seemed like that worked. Like, he showed a different side. He was making it fun did. of himself, you know? I think that's a great example, Mike. And real quick, I just want to get your uh, – Johnny chimes in, too, with uh, can't stand when reality TV stars get parts in movies. WTF, that spot should have been an actor. And he's absolutely right. You know, it's like you're kind of gobbling up a spot for something really special that can be done. Paris Hilton in the House of Wax was a joke. Acting ain't easy. Uh, Stephen A, Stephen E, uh, love Vault. Thank you very much, brother. That's definitely, it's funny. I watched the Vault trailer today because I'm cutting a trailer for something else. And it's kind of nice to watch some of those shots. And I don't really watch my movies back. Uh, once I make them, you know, unless I'm like with a really big group of people or like a you know right. family wants to see them or a friend really wants to see it, I'll watch it. But I'm I'm never like I think you're kind of fucking weird if you're just sitting at your house watching your own movies. Bizarre to me. Um, I was, so uh, I, I don't do that. But I will say this: um, I think I'm almost ready to do a rewatch of Vault just for some memories. Well, I, I can say that this week on the good old book Facebook. I was getting these uh, three-year notifications. I think the premiere of Vault was three years ago this past week because I had these photographs from the premiere, and uh, they were popping up on my uh, Facebook thing. I shared some of them as memories. That was a fun night. That was a fun night, and I, you know, I, it's funny. I, I got a post. I got, I got a couple of those photos today. Isn't uh, Johnny says I just felt like that movie was tied in so well with the flow of the movie. Thank you very much, Johnny. Uh, Thanks, isn't Johnny. it funny how you know Facebook? reminds you of these things and uh you know sometimes they're good memories sometimes i don't want to say they're bad memories but sometimes they can make you they can remind you of maybe something not so great that you were going through in your life at the time or whatever it may be or or remind you of sometimes they can be sad you know i mean um shout out rest in peace to our friend billy v uh just the other day i got one of those facebook memories and i saw my good buddy billy v who's no longer with us and it's a great pic of me and billy with his arm around me and smiling uh and it was sad but at the same time it was kind of nice it, it put a little smile on my face and um I, I had a little laugh to myself and thought of something funny that you know billy billy said one time and um so it's nice it keeps keeps people in your memory uh, i guess that's why they're called facebook memories um 
but yeah, it's uh, I don't mean to go in a little wormhole with that, but um, want to avoid stunt casting. But Mike, you're absolutely right. Mike Tyson in The Hangover is probably an example of the finest piece of stunt casting in the history of cinema. But let's take a second to think about that. Maybe it's not stunt casting because here's the thing. What was Mike playing? Himself. My, Mike. He was yeah. playing Mike Tyson. Yeah. So like it, it was my point is like maybe that's an example of we're talking about writing castable characters. Maybe that's the perfect example of stunt casting because the actor didn't have to act. They were just playing right. themselves. And now here we are. There's a movie called Vendetta. Uh, we just mentioned Theo Rossi, who was the lead in my film Vault. Theo Rossi is in a movie called Vendetta that just came out, uh, which also stars Clive Standen. Shout out, also in Vault. Um, Vendetta, starring Mike Tyson. And he ain't playing Mike Tyson. He's playing an actual character. And I saw the trailer, and you know what? It looks fucking good. Uh, you know, Mike's got some chops in it. So, um, you know, who knows? Maybe we're about to see a whole new chapter in Iron Mike's uh, entertainment career. Interesting. You just Interesting never know, buddy. Stuff. No, you don't. Um, <clears throat> one of the last things that I wanted to talk about here is just, you know, we're talking about writing castable actors. Don't be afraid. If they're talented, if they're good, they have to be good. Don't just write a fucking part for any asshole that you know just because you know them. Yeah. But if you know someone really well and you know their abilities and what they can do and what they're capable on screen, don't be afraid to write for a specific actor. Um, and I'm not even talking about a movie star. I'm talking about, you know, the average script might have, I don't know, 10 to 20 roles. You're only going to really be able to put a, quote, you know, Hollywood actor in maybe two to four of those roles for the most part i don't mean to generalize but i'm talking about let's face it guys and action the show that you're watching is geared towards people that you know if you're working for a major studio you're probably not watching in action the show is geared towards people that are getting their career on those first couple steps of of the staircase of movie making life you know they're for people that are trying to put it together um so this doesn't apply for everybody, but, you know, it's it's OK to think about who you want in your movie before the casting process. And like I said, you, you got a movie script with maybe 20 actors in it. You're really only going to be able to have a few, quote, name working actors, people that we've seen in films and television in the past. Everybody else, it's open season. Right. And yeah, you're going to have auditions and. Yeah, you're going to have people forced upon you like some, you know, might be a producer's friend or someone's kid or who the fuck knows that you're going to have to find the role for. We all there's always things called political hires. And guess what? That ain't just the movies. That's every fucking business. That's every life. That's every every life that everyone leads. There's going to be a situation where it's like, yeah, you got to hire so and so's kid or whatever. Right. Uh, it's called nepotism. This Ain't investor has a niece. She's very talented. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's... She just, mumbles that's, a lot. And she has a stutter and a stammer, but she's very talented. Yeah, so there's <laughs> always going to be that kind of a thing. But, right. you know, the point that I'm trying to make is surround yourself with talent that you know that you could call upon at the last minute. Because the, the end goal is we're all, you know, don't just write a script to write it. Write a script to actually make it. You know, we've right. talked about this in some of our other episodes, you know, particularly writing part one, where it's like when you're writing your first script, don't don't write something that you could never fucking make. Don't go writing your don't don't write your space odyssey right off the bat. It's probably not the smartest move, you know, like write something about a couple of people at a bar or write something about, you know, a crime that takes place in one spot. You know, we. It's all about writing small stories. So when you write these smaller stories, when you're first getting going, there's nothing wrong with thinking about actors in advance. You know, I mean, uh, I did ADR today with two actors that almost have like uh, an, a, a sort of a a renew a renewed uh, invitation to be in my movies. Like almost, they've always been in every one of my films, and that's Michael Zakola and Fred Sullivan. 
And there's two actors, one's from Rhode Island, one's from Massachusetts. They're two of the more talented people that I know. And almost every script that I write, whether it's a small part, because it can't always be, you know, you you can't always be able to give them the fucking lead or even a big supporting role. But almost every movie that I write, I'm like, ooh, what's something that I can write for Sullivan? What's something that I can write for Zook? Um, You know, so it's one of those things where like, use the people around you. And the reason why writing with an actor in mind is smart is because number one, even if they don't get the part and you have to let them down, you, first off, you don't have to tell them that you wrote the part for them. You know, you can keep that to yourself. But even if they know that they you know, were in mind, but political things always happen, guys. It's just, it's gonna fucking happen. If you're in this business and you're in any position of power, meaning you're a director, you're a producer, you are going to have to break someone's heart that you really care about at some point. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. It's not fucking pretty, but I've had to do it many times where you slip and you made a mistake and you told someone that they have that part, but then other shit happens and you have to pull it back. And We learn and we try not to do that. But you're always going to have to be the bad guy once in a while. It's just going to end up happening where shit ha- shit happens. Um, so whether whether they get the part or not, as a writer, when you're in the writing room, if you if you're tied in and connected to who that person is, how they operate, how they tick, how they walk, how they talk, how they operate in any every sense of the word, that's going to help you in the writing room because <clears throat> now you're not going to be like. Let's say the character's name is, you know, uh, Fred or or you're not going to be like, what would Fred do here? You're going to say, well, no, I don't I don't have to know what Fred would do. I I know what Fred would do because I know the guy really well. Uh, And you can start kind of like labeling characters with people that you actually know. And that'll help you think about how they behave, because at the end of the day, and I've read scripts like this. You ever read a script where every character is the same fucking character? And none of them are different. There's no nuances. And you have to say to yourself, did this writer just like basically write themselves in every part? Like, are you just writing some variation of yourself in every character? Or are these really very much different fucking characters? And that's what you need. Um, Johnny says, Zook. I call Mike Zucola. It's funny. It's just like funny friend stuff. I've known Zook. See, I, I just did it again. I've known Mike since almost mercy and i've always been calling him zucola but his name is zucola and that's how he pronounces it so that's why i just call him zook now that's sure. always just been my name for him but he is an awesome guy yeah. and johnny met him on the set of junction they talked for a little while and yeah mike is definitely what i would call a, a lunch pail swinger and what I mean by that is he's a guy who just shows up to work with his lunch pail. You know, whether you're doing a music video, whether you're doing a short film, whether you're doing a feature film, if it's acting, whatever it is, Mike is going to be involved. He's going to want to do it. He's going to show up. He's going to work his ass off. And you're going to get something very fucking unique out of Mike Zucola. Zucola. I think you did, a, you did a short film with him, right? That someone else directed that you produced. It was like a gangster thing. The guy's... Wasn't it Zucalo that shows up at the wrong house or the wrong apartment and the, the the gang guys kind of attack him? Was that Mike? That's right. That was Mike. And that was a film directed and written by J. Antonio Figueroa. And it was really terrific. And I'm sure you can look that up. Wonder, we'll find out where we can look that up and check it out on YouTube. I'm trying YouTube. to remember the name of the title of it, to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure uh, we did that one back in, I think, I want to say 2013. Um, but yeah, Mike Zuckel is a, a very talented cat. Um, but don't be afraid to write for people that you know. It's one of those things that, you know, they're right there. They're at your fingertips. You have them at your disposal. And a lot of times, like, you know, sometimes if you're even stuck on like a story and like, what do I write about? You know, just start thinking of like, well, who do I have access to? Who do I have at my disposal? You know, like who's around me kind of a thing. Uh, and then you might start saying, oh, these characters, what am I getting? What's the picture that's being painted here? Before you know it, 
you might start just writing some scenes and getting some some synergies connected. Exactly. Um, Mike, are you researching over there? I'm trying to find Zucalo's uh, IMDb page. So I think I'm going to go to uh, uh, the manor because I know he's in that as Trevor. And that's how I'm going to find uh, Michael Zucalo's. Uh, for, you know, that just the name, is the, no, most... the name of the name of the movie was. Oh, you're trying to find the name of that short? Yeah. It was Wired for Sound was the name. Oh, of the okay. Movie. Well, there you go. Thanks. Yeah. Why, why did you just say so? <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that's what you were looking for. Yeah. Why? The name of the movie is called Wired for Sound. It's, it was written by J. Antonio Figueroa. We shot it yes. a few years ago. 2016. Um, 2016. Very funny uh, short film. Uh, a lot of talented actors. David Gears in that movie. Zuko uh, plays Jason. Yeah. Uh, your Zuko your plays boy, Jason. Uh, Jose Gonzalez is in that movie. Yeah. Well. Um, so if you're looking well, for a Mike, good short yeah. film, check out if, if Mike, Wired for Sound. It is a good one, and that's why I brought it up. Because Zuccolo was good in that, but I want to—I have to say, Michael uh, needs to update his IMDb page because he doesn't even have a photograph on his IMDb Pro page. Come on, Mike, what are you doing Damn here, it, buddy? Damn it, Mike! Damn it! Well, hey, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, buddy. What are you gonna do? Um, yeah. So we're winding it down as far as writing castable characters, but just to wrap it up, I mean, ultimately, avoid cliches, find those humanizing qualities, find something that's relatable, but unique at the same time, you know, find those kind of characters. And ultimately, at the end of the day, when you when you put your script down, it should be the kind of character that if you're an actor, you'd want to play them. And if you're not an actor, you'd want to sit there and, and invest a good hour and 45 minutes to two hours to watching them do their thing. Um, so if there are any other questions, or I should say if there aren't any other questions about writing castable characters, we're going to start to wind the show down. Um, again, thank you, everybody, for watching with us. We really appreciate it. We're sorry that we haven't been able to stick to a consistent day. But we're trying to just so far. I'm. I gotta say, I don't want to pat ourselves on the back too hard. But this is the eighth episode of And Action on the eighth consecutive week. We have not missed a week. We've been putting out a show every week. I'm really proud of that. And it ain't easy to do because you know you can imagine everybody's got a busy life. No matter what you're doing, Mike and I are, are no different. Uh, so we've been juggling a lot to kind of put out a weekly show. Uh, it's going to get tricky towards the end of the month because I'm going to be going into productions and and some of these things are literally shooting from 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. So we might have to pre-record a couple of shows, but we're going to really stay consistent with getting an episode out every week to you. Um, and again, if you haven't already, please do subscribe, subscribe, subscribe tell your friends to subscribe. It's all about getting those numbers up because eventually we want to do things like get some sponsors and really just build this show up and blow it up so that that community that we were talking about can be fostered in a way that we would really like to build it. Um, yeah, sharing the videos is probably the best thing. And, and if I could give a little advice to folks, when you share the video, uh, it's it's even more helpful. It's, it's great if you just share the link but if you actually put in your description of your Facebook share, for instance, hey, this is a great filmmaking podcast that I've been listening to or filmmaking broadcasts and give this show a chance and blah, blah, blah. So, But I know some of the guys, Johnny, Stephen E., uh, Ari, have been very loyal to the show, very supportive. Stephen's always keeping us on task as when we're doing the show. My friend Kim Kaling is watching in spirit tonight, Tommy. She went off to see Paul McCartney. So it took a beetle to, to preempt her watching of the show, but she's been watching uh, every time until now. She'll watch the replay. But, hey, uh, I will I will <laughs> gladly tip my cap to a beetle any day of the week and, and you know, step aside. Sure. <laughs> well, we appreciate that. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, like Mike said, uh, it would mean the world to us if you could uh, share out the show, tell everybody that you enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully attract some like-minded filmmaker friends to the show and get people on here. If you want to follow me, you can follow me on social media. I'm on Instagram, at Tom Danucci. It's spelled 
just as you see it right here. Where, where's my finger? There it is. Tom Danucci, D E N U C C I. Uh, find me on Twitter. Same thing. Um, but the big thing is just subscribing to my channel, uh, which just go into your YouTube search engine and hit Tom Danucci. Um, Mike, we can find you on so your various socials as well. Yeah, MikeMessier.com. And if you scroll to the bottom of MikeMessier.com, uh, I've got my subscribe to Mike Messier YouTube channel, my Twitter, my Instagram. Uh, for those I'd like to read, the books are linked right from the thing. I've got six titles now up on Amazon. Oh, God, uh, it wouldn't be an episode if we didn't get the friggin' books out. Let's well, get them out. Get I think out, you're... Mike. Aren't Get you ordering out. these for all of the Woodhaven Productions team members? Aren't you ordering well, in bulk to to? I was just going to cut the I was just going to cut the cover off and wallpaper my new bathroom with the uh, cover. <laughs> it is a great cover. Well, I do like that. I, show the show the fighter play basketball one more time. Yeah, yeah, Same. yeah. It's a nice cover. But nice before cover. we go, let me just talk about what's on what's in store for next week. Everybody, I'd like to, to stop and take a quick minute to wish a happy birthday to actor William Forsyth. Today is his birthday, uh, and birthday. we're very excited to uh, have worked with William. I've not only acted alongside William, I've gotten a chance to direct him. We actually uh, even, for a second, almost co-wrote something together. Mm. Um, so we are going to bring you a full deep dive episode on actor William Forsyth. You'd remember him. I mean, I got a list here because there's just so many. You, you you can't even rattle them off. But people who love William Forsyth will know movies like Out for Justice, Raising Arizona, Dick Tracy, The Rock, Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, The Devil's Rejects, American Me, Cold Pursuit, Blue Streak, Once Upon a Time in America, The Substitute. The list goes on and on. William Forsyth is a bona fide legend and i i really love the time i i cherish the time that i spent with william yeah because he is one of the last actors that are still active that are from the old school hollywood generation the era of you know mid to late 80s hollywood which guys Mid to late '80s Hollywood might as well have been the fucking Wild West. Uh, you know, th there was there was not much different in the mid '80s than it was to like it might as well have been like the '60s and the '70s. Just in terms of like excess and how everything was big and the fucking budgets were massive and and productions were just you know the the term this is a production was really like you know a thing. Uh, so I love hearing William stories Shoulder about. Pads. Yeah, just like what it was like making films in that kind of era of excess um, and how things just aren't quite like that anymore. But as far as talent goes, they don't get much better than William Forsythe. Hey, Tommy, did you ever see the movie The Player? <clears throat> that I think I think The Player was Tim Robbins' breakthrough role and it came out in 1989. Robert Altman film, I believe. The Player. Oh, I can't hear you, buddy. Was Forsythe in that? Uh, I don't know if Forsyth was in it, but when you talked about the excess of mid to late 80s Hollywood, mm -hmm. uh, The Player is a movie that critiques, analyzes, parodies, satires, has fun with, in kind of a dark, almost a, not a horror film, but a dark, I guess you call it a dark comedy or dark drama, but Tim Tim Robbins plays a would-be uh, film uh, maker, I think a writer, and his story yeah. gets so corrupted by the Hollywood machine. And along the way, uh, somebody gets murdered and a bunch of things happen. And it has so many cameos from Mike. Bruce. If it's got nothing to do with William Forsyth, I don't give a shit, to be honest with you. Well, you're talking about the excess of Hollywood in the mid to eight, late, uh, late 80s, buddy. That's why I'm making no, reference I'm, to it. I, I understand. Um, I haven't seen that one, but I do like Tim Robbins. And, uh, you know, I'll, we'll have to. Dig that up one of these days. So you got to watch The Player and Highlander. And I have to sit here and watch six episodes or six seasons of Stranger Things. You've got your work cut out for for you. <laughs> and Stephen, Stephen E. tells us that if you're a fan of Karate Kid, Mike Barnes, a.k.a. Sean Cannon, Kanan, 
created a web series called Studio City. It's streaming on Amazon Prime. So, oh, I have that. I have Amazon Prime, so I can watch that. There's a lot out there, folks. And Stephen also has seen the player. And yes, I agree. We do all have to chill together. We're going to do an end of the year and action hangout. And uh, if people are spread out throughout the country, well, we could just do a, a Zoom hang. Keep it keep it loose. Everybody, you know, can sip on their beverage of choice. And uh, we just bullshit. Talk about movies. Talk about acting. Talk about wrestling. Talk about whatever the fuck we want, because this is America. But next week, we'll be talking about William Forsythe. Episode 9. And action. We'll see you then. Thanks again so much, everybody.